good morning, everyone who's uh, in here, and a good afternoon, everyone who's connecting to us uh, overseas. And uh, we will be starting our seminar today. So uh, today's uh, presentation is given by uh, David Powell from the University of New South Wales uh, from Canberra. And this is going to be uh, on uh, the metasurfaces for microwave uh, and uh, traverse uh, bands. Uh, and I think uh, the pilots are uh, on uh, the uh, wideband and uh, achromatic metasurfaces, as far as I remember. And if you have any questions, uh, just write them in the chat or raise your hand in the uh, Zoom and I'll interrupt the speaker at some point and uh, give you some time to uh, ask your questions. And uh, if, uh, if you are not presenting, which is most of the, the majority of the people, please turn off your camera unless you're asking questions because it's going to be interfering then with the recording. So, so, all right, David, I think you're welcome to uh, start. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, it's a long time since I've been to uh, ITMO University. Um, many fond memories, but uh, I guess it's a silver lining uh, that uh, I have this opportunity to be back uh, with all of you again. So, for those who don't know, I'm David Powell uh, from University of New South Wales, Canberra, uh, previously from ANU. The work I'm gonna to talk to you about today uh, is primarily the work of Andreas, Ashif and Mamanur, who are three uh, UNSW PhD students. Uh, but of course, uh, it builds on uh, many of my previous uh, research activities with collaborators listed there. So just briefly, University of New South Wales is one of the big uh, research intensive universities in Australia, uh, but we're just a small campus located in Canberra. And the purpose of our existence is actually to teach uh, undergraduate students who are going to become military officers. Um, but we're also uh, expected to be active in fundamental and applied research. Now, it's not just a defense or, or military related research, um, but it's, it goes broader than that. Some of the strengths of our campus are in cybersecurity, uh, space research, and project management, but uh, I'm not going to talk about any of those topics. So, within our campus, there are several schools. Uh, I'm affiliated with the School of Engineering and Information Technology. And then within that school, we have some uh, research focus areas, which are semi-formal groupings of uh, academics along with their students and postdocs. Ours is called the Advanced Electromagnetics Group. And we cover a bit of a strange mix of quantum science, metamaterials, nanophotonics, photonic materials, acoustics somehow gets in there and microwaves and millimeter waves and even a little bit of terahertz too. So my particular research areas are, have been relatively broad over the years. Uh, so I've done quite a bit and continue to do a lot in acoustics, uh, particularly with meta surfaces and meta gratings and a lot of uh, ideas that we take from electromagnetism uh, translate well into acoustics, such as bionisotropy. Acoustic radiation forces are an interesting analog of uh, optical forces. Then in microwave, millimeter wave and terahertz metamaterials, this is of course where I did most of my research at ANU. Uh, res main interests are in metasurfaces, Nonlinear and tunable structures, chiral and bionisotropic effects. And then there's yet another little sub branch that I've worked on that's this uh, quasi normal mode, very theoretical kind of analysis of metamaterials and nanostructures. But of all those topics today, I'm only going to bore you with uh, one of them. 
So I imagine most of you are already familiar, but for those who aren't, I'll give a brief recap. A meta surface is, I would consider some kind of 2D array of engineered scatterers, such as this classic uh, paper here. Uh, most often we're talking about some kind of inhomogeneous. So all these elements across the surface are not identical to each other. They can be understood as the 2D version of metamaterials. And typically we're looking to control the amplitude, the phase or the polarization of a transmitted or reflected wave. Now, many people think that metasurfaces sort of appeared with this paper in uh, 2011 from the Capasso group. But I think if you look back over the literature going back decades, you'll see that many of the same ideas are already in the literature on reflect arrays, frequency selective surfaces, blaze grating and diffractive optics. Uh, still, metasurfaces brings many new concepts and as well as building on those. And so metasurfaces have been demonstrated basically everywhere from RF to visible, but also for other types of waves, including acoustics amongst others. So the most typical way uh, that we think about a, a wave manipulation with a meta surface is that we have some gradient of phase along the surface, such as this uh, sawtooth type uh, linear phase profile here. And that gives us some refraction of the beam. And if the phase, for example, is non-uniform, this hyperbolic distribution, all right, then with a thin layer, we can converge an incident beam down to a point. Or if we do something more complex, such as uh, engineering phase in a sort of uh, azimuthal distribution, we can do more interesting things like generating uh, vortex beams. Uh, probably the most important class of metasurfaces are Huygens metasurfaces. And here we achieve impedance matching in transmission with a balanced response to electric and magnetic fields. So there's two parts to this. We can get nearly 100% transmission, which is nice, but what's more important, we can get full two pi phase coverage for efficient beam refraction. Because if you look at most of these functions here, you require full two pi phase range to get efficient beam control. So sometimes this involves, as in this microwave work, separate elements with electric and distinct electric and magnetic responses. But that's not a requirement. We see in optics that the all dielectric approach is very popular. So the near infrared optics and microwaves and even terahertz are pretty well explored fields for metamaterials. On the other hand, there's this millimeter wave frequency range, which we can roughly define as 30 to 300 gigahertz. That's of interest for 5G and potential 6G communication, for automotive radar, uh, the security scanners at airports are based on millimeter waves. And if anything, there's even more need for meta surfaces in this frequency range because you know, a lens in optics, you know, it's a millimeter thick, it's many thousands of wavelengths thick, but nobody really cares. It's quite compact. If you'd make the same tens, hundreds or thousands of wavelength thick bulk optical structure at uh, millimeter waves, it just becomes ridiculous. So anything that can enable uh, flat optics, if you like, simple, uh, complex beam manipulation with simple structures that can be done with printed circuit fabrication would really push this uh, frequency range into many further applications. 
and the most promising uh, architecture for metasurfaces in microwaves and for millimeter waves uh, are those based on printed circuit designs. Uh, now, if we have the conventional uh, split ring resonator, uh, although that is planar, uh, its orientation would be incorrect in a planar design and difficult to fabricate. So the better alternative is to have something like this, where you have three different uh, metallic layers. And what you end up with is that there are currents, for example, on the front and back surface that are out of phase. That kind of gives you some effective circulating current, I, and then some magnetic uh, dipole moment. I should check my right hand rule here. All right, so even though it doesn't look like a split ring resonator, you can get very much the same physics. So to create a Huygens metasurface, what we do is we have the front layer and the back layer. So we're looking now top down at this structure here, front layer and the back layer are identical. All right, and then we have some uh, inner layer that will differ. Just more of a brief aside, it is possible to have this front and back layer have different properties that leads to a bionisotropic structure, which can give some higher efficiency at large refraction angles. So now we get into the uh, thick of it. How do we model these metasurfaces? I think many people working in the field would be familiar with the so-called generalized Snell's law. The reason it's called a generalized Snell's law is if we throw away this term on the right here, we would just end up with the familiar Snell's law. And it tells us that the phase relationship between the transmitted and incident wave can be controlled by having a gradient of the phase response along a metasurface. This is a bit limiting. Uh, it doesn't allow you to express all possible wave manipulation functions. Uh, so a more general approach is to use these equivalent surface impedances, uh, electric, magnetic, and potentially bionisotropic. All right, so what we're illustrating here is that here's some metasurface. We specify a wave, our incoming wave, we specify the desired transmitted wave, we possibly specify some reflected field. All right, now these equations look messy, but what they tell us is that if we know all these things, we can instantly pull out these equivalent parameters uh, that describe the required properties of a metasurface. And in practice, we can simplify this down to an equivalent two port network model. So anyone working in circuit theory, microwave engineering would be very familiar with such a model. Instead of voltages and currents, we have electric and magnetic fields on the two sides. And of course the point to the key difference here is that all of these parameters vary along the surface when we have an inhomogeneous metasurface. So if we know the property, the wave manipulation function we'd like to achieve, we can relatively straightforwardly obtain this two port model. Then we have a challenge of how to design some metasurfaces that uh, match this model. And the three metallic layer model that I showed before uh, has a very powerful way of uh, representing that. So here, we've replaced each of the three patterned metallic layers by some equivalent surface impedance. And then, uh, so that's represented here in the equivalent circuit model. And the dielectric layers in between are just treated as sections of transmission line. 
And the reason we can do that is because the equations for a transmission line are essentially the same as the Fresnel equations for uh, dielectric slabs. And again, these expressions may look a bit hairy, but what they tell us is that if you know these parameters here, the global parameters of required of the metasurface, and you've specified some substrate thickness that gives these parameters here, you have a recipe for a simple, three simple sheet impedances that are required. All right, uh, and so how to achieve those? Well, in practice, we would choose some metallic geometry to put on each of these layers and we create some kind of lookup table relating our geometric parameters to these impedances. So we're interested to apply this kind of model uh, and this kind of synthesis method to create structures at millimeter waves. But so this model is well established, let's say for this kind of structure here, where we're talking sort of lambda on 10 kind of uh, level of discretization. So highly sub wavelength structure. There we can, it's been shown that such uh, this kind of transmission line model works very well. Now, if we were to take this structure here and attempt to scale it to 80 gigahertz, we'd find that the features, feature sizes would be much too small for any kind of standard or even any specialized PCB fabrication. Of course, it could be done in a, a clean room uh, with microlithography, but then you have a structure, an aperture size that's still quite large and impractical for uh, microlithography. So we really want to find a solution that enables us to use standard PCB fabrication. So we use these much simpler geometry, the so-called dog bone resonator, which is just a dipole uh, with some uh, loading, capacitive loading at the end. And this gives us features that are always greater than 100 micron, but a much coarser unit cell that's sort of lambda on three. And this causes problems with this transmission line model, as I'll show here. So the dashed, the black dash curve represents the designed amplitude, but more importantly, the designed phase for a unit cell containing three such elements cascaded together. But when we go and do full wave numerics of those three cascaded layers, what we get instead is this blue curve, this one here. So we've seen there's a significant frequency shift of the resonance that has led to the phase being completely incorrect at the operating frequency. So it looks like the method has essentially become useless. The reason for this discrepancy is near field coupling between different layers of this structure. So here with fine features, the sort of fringing fields uh, aren't too strong in the next layer, but in our structure, they are absolutely huge and they cause this shift. So rather than uh, throwing this uh, method away, because it is quite powerful, what we do is we augment this uh, near field, uh, this circuit model here to incorporate the coupling. What I mean by that is that if we have some currents here, they generate some fringing near fields which interact with currents on the other layer. So what we end up with looks a little bit monstrous, but what you see is we've got the same transmission line elements, the same self impedances of each layer, but then we have these controlled sources 
And what they represent is mutual impedance between each of these layers. So we can put that all together in this equivalent matrix, right, which we call our sort of near field matrix. In the original case, in the more standard method, it would just have these diagonal elements. So these are the self impedances uh, that we want, if you like, but it also gives these additional mutual terms. And we can combine this near field matrix with what we call the far field matrix. So that's just the equivalent circuit model of a transmission line. And we can fully account for all coupling, both near field and far field within this uh, three layered structure. But it does leave a bit of a question. How do we find this mutual impedance? We can use full wave simulation. So here we've taken a kind of side view of this three layer structure. Of course, recall these are all patterned metallic layers with some dog bones, for example, on them. And if we want this impedance Z13 between the front layer and the back layer, we can do a numerical simulation that includes only those two metallic layers and the dielectric in between. Similarly, if we want this mutual coupling between the front layer and the middle layer, we can do a simulation containing only those elements. And with a bit of uh, transformation of equivalent uh, circuit parameters, we are able to extract these two impedances. So what we've done here now, this is the same figure I showed before, all right? So the black dashed line, again, was the design phase. The light blue is what we get from full wave numerics. And then this dashed red line is our model that incorporates those additional coupling terms. So what we've shown is that we can capture the physics of fairly complex near field interaction into a relatively simple circuit model. And of course, once we can do that, then we have a good chance of actually in accounting for it in our design methodology. So how do we go about doing that? We've uh, designed a metasurface to just do uniform anomalous refraction uh, at 80 gigahertz. And we've just chosen an angle of 55 degrees. What we're looking at in this figure is an initial design where we've neglected the near field coupling. All right, uh, so this is our operating frequency here at 80 gigahertz. And we can see the peak transmission into the desired mode has shifted significantly. All right, and then these unwanted modes are much increased. So what we do, we calculate the mutual impedances as per the method I showed earlier, but then iteratively correct our design uh, to take it, those into account. Once we do that, we end up with a structure that is now basically 90% efficient, there's still some slight discrepancy, but the operating frequency is almost bang on. And here you can see the results of full wave simulation. So this is our incoming wave. You see here the relatively coarse looking metasurface made from dog bones. There would be three layers. And then we get a pretty clean plane type wave coming out. Of course, the ob obvious way of dealing with this problem is to, to say, well, why do we need a, such a complex model? Uh, simulation packages such as CST or HFSS have built in optimizers. Can't we just throw it at the optimizer and not do all this fancy modeling? Well, what we show here is a comparison 
of our method, which is the solid lines uh, versus the kind of more general optimizer built into a numerical package, which is the dash lines. And so depending on which unit cell you look at, you know, we can converge within as few as three iterations uh, to a much lower, this merit function gives the kind of error. We can converge much better, uh, much faster than a direct numerical simulation. And of course that matters more if you have a very large meta surface with many elements. But I think more importantly, we retain some insight into what's going on. We have a model of the physics, um, whereas just throwing an optimizer at it, you really have no idea why it comes up with the structure that it does. So having uh, come up with this uh, design, improved design methodology, our next step was to build some uh, design and fabricate some refracting metasurfaces just using a commercial PCB process. Uh, we have to note that at this frequency range, the roughness of the copper is pretty significant, um, but that's uh, quite easy to take into account with our iterative procedure. Um, here you just see the layer stack up that we've used showing the metallic layers separated by the dielectric material. So this uh, sample was characterized in a uh, biostatic millimeter wave measurement system. It's described in this paper here of Andreas's uh, and it's located in at IEESA, a company based in Luxembourg. And so what we have is a transmit antenna at some particular angle of incidence. Our meta surface is located here amongst some absorber and then an angular sweep is done of the receiving antenna. So this here shows the uh, physical anechoic chamber where the measurements were made. And what we do is we look at the scattered modes. All right, as a func so instead of taking the full angular uh, angular pattern at every frequency, we pick out the different uh, propagating modes of the structure, the diffraction modes. And we see that this purple one here is our desired mode. It agrees very well with full wave simulation and we see pretty good suppression of our unwanted modes. We do get a little bit of frequency shift. So our desired original design uh, frequency is here at 80. Uh, we get best performance at 83, but we're able to reconcile that by some very careful measurements of the actual fabricated geometry. Um, and that gives very good agreement with full wave simulation. We can use our same platform to also design a lens. Uh, so here, of course, the desired phase profile is hyperbolic. And this phase profile, of course, can be put through the same machinery to find the required surface impedances. Again, we're making use of this dog bone geometry. So what you're looking at here in this figure is the designed or the required hyperbolic phase profile uh, also compared with in this yellow dash curve uh, is what we get from actual experimental probing of the surface of the structure and compared with numerics. So this is what our meta surface looks like here. You can see it's kind of a periodic arrangement of these dog bones. Again, you're seeing one layer of a structure with three metallic layers. Now, just a little point that maybe not everyone appreciates. When you have a structure that the, and the focal point is not so large compared to the wavelength, it turns out that the phase focus 
is not the same as the point of maximum amplitude. You can understand that from analysis of the Green's function. It's detailed further in this paper, but I just want to note here in our structure, they differ by 20% and that's precisely explainable by such a model. So how do we characterize this uh, lens? We do measurements uh, with, so here we now have a near field probe. It's mounted on a 2D translation stage. And here we have an exciting horn antenna. This is our metasurface. And of course, these are uh, millimeter wave extenders that are connected to a vector network analyzer. And these results that we obtain from this system, we compare with a, a simple dipole model where that dipole model is fed with the required phase of each element. And here we're looking at the transverse beam profile. So we're only focusing in on one axis. So it's cylindrical focusing and we get very good agreement with our simulated profile there. We also compare the amplitude in the plane of focusing. And again, we see pretty good agreement with simulation. So the point that's been uh, marked here in red is what we call the amplitude focus. And what's wonderful about this uh, near field scanning system, it's precise enough that we can uh, do phase resolved measurements. So we're also able to pick out the phase focus and we get good agreement with simulation there. Uh, and just here are the numbers showing that we get, again, pretty good agreement as expected, due very much to the quite careful experimental work of Andreas here. Now, just a, a quick final note on such a, a lens, we can uh, apply it as a switch beam antenna. So if we have this, if you have a lens and you change the location of a source dipole, then you can shift the direction of a radiated plane wave. And again, uh, we've done measurements of such a system, uh, basically just a different configuration of measurements in the same anechoic chamber. And here you can see for different locations of the source, you know, we get a nice directive beam as we shift the source uh, by different amounts, we steer it off axis. We steer it up to 12 degrees. We can steer further, but then the side lobes degrade beyond this 15 dB. So uh, if there are no questions on that part, I'd like to go on with the next section of this talk. Uh, and that's of course very linked. Uh, and it's on broadband metasurfaces at microwaves and millimeter waves. So the first point would be, what do we actually mean by broadband? So most metasurfaces make use of some kind of resonant element, and that limits the bandwidth. But many applications, again, thinking of those 5G and 6G comms or automotive radar, we really need to operate over a significant fractional bandwidth. Now, in some cases, it's relatively straightforward what we mean by broadband. It could just be a frequency selective surface where we need broad transmission resonance. So that's just a matter of engineering the queue. On the other hand, if it's some kind of wave plate, it just requires some broadband dichroism. This again is, uh, I won't say easy, but it can is possible to do this over very broad fractional bandwidths. But when it comes to manipulating the phase of a wavefront, the requirements are really much more stringent. To avoid spurious diffraction, we need to keep the phase gradient over a broad bandwidth uh, 
even if we do that, it can still lead to a change, for example, in focal length with frequency. So I'll just try to illustrate that further here. What we have is some metasurface. There's a single frequency wave coming in. It's refracted off in some direction given by according to this phase profile. And I'd just like to remind you that a metasurface can often make sense to understand it in terms of diffraction theory. And in my view, this is this paper gives the best kind of explanation of that. So you can think of this as kind of like a grating that we engineer in the metasurface profile. So this is what's well understood. Now, as soon as you take that structure and apply a broadband wave, well, what typically happens here is that away from the design frequency, this phase response becomes distorted, right? No longer satisfied, typically quite random. And so we get not just the desired beam, but a number of spurious diffracted beams. So what we might call a broadband dispersive structure is one which carefully controls this phase profile so that it is maintained or closely maintained over a broad bandwidth. So we avoid this spurious diffraction and at different frequencies, we have only a single diffraction order. However, the consequence of that is that the refraction angle will be different for every different frequency or for this range of frequencies. Where the real challenge lies is to take some structure where an incoming broadband wave, all frequencies are diffracted in or refracted in the same direction. Now, what that means is that at every different frequency, you need a slightly different phase gradient to satisfy the requirements of diffraction theory. Therefore, you must have a non-periodic structure. Of course, we're hardly the first to uh, think of this. It's been a very active topic in uh, optical and near infrared metasurfaces. Here, the typical approach is these uh, thick, uh, relatively thick dielectric structures. All right, when I say thick, I mean they're thick compared to the wavelength. Now, at optical frequencies, that's still a very small length. So, in practice, it doesn't matter. But when we talk about our microwave or millimeter waves, it becomes quite impractical. A very different approach is based on geometric phase or Pancharatnam Berry phase. Now this has some issues with uh, reduced efficiency because it works on polarization conversion and it does work with, uh, requires working with circular polarization. Now, if you can tolerate those constraints, then this is probably the most promising. This gives you by far the largest fractional bandwidth, but many applications you can't put up with that. Uh, coming more from the microwave and frequency selective surface point of view, filter synthesis methods have been used. The trouble with this approach is you end up with many, many layers and you need a different dielectric thickness in each layer and in each pixel in each layer. So it becomes quite impractical. So what we're seeking to do is take the three layer, three metal layer metasurface approach and to see, can this be made broadband and achromatic? So you recall that once you know the required fields on the two sides of the metasurface. There are closed form expressions for each of these three impedances and they are already frequency dependent. So we can just use the existing formulas. 
and calculate these over a broad bandwidth. And this is what I'm showing here. So as a function of frequency, X1 and X3, that just means the imaginary part of this and this impedance, which are identical. So we see a kind of resonant structure that looks uh, pretty familiar. Now, the, we have to check, however, that the impedance that this kind of formula gives us is uh, passive and causal. And we do that by applying what's known as Foster's reactance theorem, which simply says that this impedance must be an increasing function of frequency. This is pretty much analogous if we think about dielectric media to requiring normal dispersion. So yes, you can overcome it if you have losses, but we're not interested in that case. And what we find when we look here at this middle layer is there's some frequency range where this reactance actually decreases with frequency. So we cannot realize that with a passive causal simple metallic layer. And this is what sets the bandwidth limit of achromatic uh, metasurfaces based on this kind of uh, architecture. So what we do is we take, we approximate the expressions for each layer and these enable us to find the following limits. So what we see is that the delta F, so that's our operating bandwidth, and delta X, that's the size of our aperture, there's this trade-off between them. All right, so you see here, we've got delta X, delta F, and then the other factor that comes in is the desired refraction angle. So the larger this refraction angle, the worse and worse this trade-off. So you can always have a very large bandwidth if you're willing to have a very tiny aperture metasurface. And if you go for a large aperture, you end up with necessarily a small fractional bandwidth. There's some, we came up with some analogous expression for metasurface lenses. Here, it's very similar conclusion. Your aperture size shown on the X axis must be traded off with your fractional bandwidth. And the closer this focal point or the larger your numerical aperture, you see the worse this trade-off gets. Right, so high numerical apertures will be down here. As an aside, we also investigated the bioanisotropic case uh, and we found that the trade-off there is even worse. Subsequent to our work, some quite similar expressions were found for all dielectric structures uh, in this work from the Monticona group. Now that was a somewhat simplified analysis that ignored the effect of the dielectric substrate. In the subsequent work here, we take that into account. Uh, what we're looking at here is the reflective case. And we find this simple relationship here between the fractional bandwidth, the normalized thickness of our dielectric layer, and then the uh, angle of refraction. Now here we're talking about a dispersive case. So this is where we maintain the efficiency of diffraction, but let the diffraction angle vary with frequency. So this, this equation here is plotted by this dashed line. What we show on this figure is that the substrate thickness and the normalized bandwidth have some relationship. For example, this blue curve, which is pretty much the best case achievable, that's for substrate with a dielectric constant of one. All right, you can see you get a maximum at around a quarter wavelength here. So that's the best you can do by having quarter wavelength dielectric layers. As you start to increase that dielectric constant to here three or nine, 
while this approximation still holds, it only holds over a more limited range. So you really shrink the bandwidth you can achieve. I'm running out of time, I think, so I might briefly skip over. Note that we did look at the achromatic case and that is significantly more challenging uh, to achieve because it has this dependence on the aperture. Uh, and we compare this limit here, given by the dash line, with several different structures reported in the literature, even some multi-resonant structures, and they all fell within this uh, limit we derived. So how to achieve, so it's all very well to find such a limit, um, but how we actually design broadband, in this case, dispersive structures to achieve this limit. Well, what's shown here is the phase response of some meta-atoms, some unit cells. So a typical narrowband design, each, so this phase, this is of each different unit cell across the meta-surface. We see that we only match the required phase response at a single frequency. A broadband design is one that matches over some significant fractional bandwidth as is shown in this curve here. So this requires that we control the Q factor or equivalently the uh, group delay of our meta atoms. And I note here we're talking about reflective structures. So equivalent circuit is a little bit simpler. We just have one dielectric layer given by a transmission line, metallic ground plane, and the one pattern metallic layer. And what we do here is we take, we look at the required impedance, this blue curve. So that's what comes from those uh, conventional uh, synthesis techniques. And then we can approximate it, that's shown by this red dash curve, by, for example, a series LC circuit. And we do that simply by considering not only the impedance, but also its derivative with frequency. So like a first order dispersion term, taking those into account gives us values of inductance and capacitance. We can then use them to choose appropriate geometry, such as this dog bone. It's been cut in half, but that's a, a dog bone where we can know that, for example, this separation here is related to the capacitance, width of metallic layers, relates to the inductance. We also find that for some cells, we actually need a parallel induct uh, LC circuit to get a better fit. And what that leads to here is not a is well a, a connected or complementary uh, structure where it's a continuous metallic layer with a patent hole in it. Uh, so again, this uh, kind of structure has been uh, fabricated, uh, designed and fabricated uh, for the millimeter wave frequency range. Now what I'm showing here is a reference narrowband structure all right, just based on these simple dog bones. And we see here that we get a bandwidth of uh, around 9%, where we can see what we consider here is how well above the, so how well the desired diffraction order is clear of all these spurious diffraction orders as illustrated here. Uh, for comparison purposes, this is what our broadband, one supercell of our broadband structure. So you see there's a lot more variation in the geometry. And in particular, we end up with these connected metallic structures because those correspond to the parallel resonances. And there we, you'll see in this figure, we get a very significant increase in fractional bandwidth roughly doubling. So 
our uh, desired uh, propagating mode here is much higher in amplitude. And again, we're very clear, we're well above all these uh, unwanted diffraction orders that we need to suppress. So this procedure of fitting impedances to this LC equivalent circuit model, we've also done it for a transmissive lens. So it's illustrated here. You know, we're trying to, again, focus down to a point. Here, we're talking about X-band, so nine gigahertz. Uh, and what you're looking at here are the patterns of the metallic layers. So the outer layers are these variations on the dog bone structure. So this is sort of the well-known structure. But what's more interesting is this inner layer, it always needs to be a parallel LC circuit. So you see it's this inverse kind of cut structure um, that's required for achromatic operation. And this, uh, what you see here, as some of you will be familiar with, the parallel plate waveguide uh, hosted at ANU. This is our source. So it's, of course, it's a fully 2D experiment. We close a lid so that there's only a single propagating mode in this 2D measurement. There's our meta surface and we measure the field behind it here, as well as a uh, narrow band design for comparison. So it's uh, quite a bit of information here, but let's start with our achromatic structure. So you're looking here at the 2D scan of electric field shown for five different frequencies. So we see that the achromatic design does a pretty good job of keeping its shape, of keeping a good focused beam shape across all frequencies. Whereas a narrow band design with conventional techniques, it really falls apart and um, only, only achieves reasonable focusing at one frequency. That can be kind of confirmed by some profiles of the field through the focal length. We see our achromatic structure really keeps a nice shape, but this narrow band structure is uh, all over the place. And that work was reported recently. And I'd just like to again remind you that this stuff has been the uh, work of my PhD student, Ashif. So with remaining time, I'd just like to talk about one uh, other project that uh, I think fits uh, a little bit different direction, but in the same general theme of these structures. And that's about how we create highly sub wavelength meta atoms uh, for, uh, for example, for a refractive meta surface. So the issue that often crops up with metasurfaces, particular if we have some dipoles, here I'm showing some dipoles, and what's not shown here, perhaps I'll just illustrate for you, we're considering the case where there's a metallic ground plane behind it. So we're talking about a reflective structure. For such a structure, Yes, you do get full two pi phase shift, but, and you can detune the resonance to cover most of this range, but it's almost impossible to get the full two pi. It's only asymptotically two pi. All right, now, and this same applies for a Huygens metasurface. Now, if you only have a few elements, for example, if we pick a few, you know, let's say we have four elements per unit cell, then a little bit of a gap in the phase coverage doesn't matter too much because we don't expect them to be closely spaced anyway. 
if we'd like very fine discretization, then this is putting a limit on the phase coverage we achieve. The way to overcome that, or at least one way to overcome that, is to break symmetry and introduce some quadrupolar type modes. So that's what's shown in this uh, second row here. So we have two unequal dipole type structures that leads to a dipole type mode and a quadrupole type mode. Of course, they're not pure modes. And you can see we get a phase response showing the signature from both modes. However, what we see is this second mode, it's what's sometimes called overdamped, maybe undercoupled would be a better term. And therefore, it hasn't actually helped us to improve our phase coverage. But with a little bit more control over the hybridization between these two modes by adding some additional coupling structures, you see we can rebalance the amplitudes here. We can underdamp that second resonance so we get over 2 pi phase shift. So this is in theory 4 pi phase shift and we can really reach that entire phase range. So what I'll show you here is this is just some uh, this is some numerical simulation, the work of Mumnur, where we're now looking at the terahertz frequency range, but of course the concept could be applied to microwaves as well. And we see very, very fine discretization here. We get as shown by these black and red triangles, we get, I believe it's full phase coverage with no gap at the end. And then this here shows the efficiency of scattering into different diffraction orders. And we get pretty high efficiency with minimal excitation of spurious modes. Now, just a brief note on why you'd want to do this, because in the previous works, I actually showed that you don't need fine discretization if you're going to do some simple function like creating a lens or doing the, you know, the anomalous refraction as demonstrated here. But in the literature, there are several papers showing that if you introduce auxiliary surface waves into your metasurface design, you can create a whole range of new metasurface designs that just aren't possible uh, with more simple approaches. So, and so far there have been no experimental demonstrations except in acoustics. So I think this structure has the potential to unlock a whole range of exciting new uh, wave manipulation functions, um, but we haven't got there yet. So I think now I'll, uh, time to conclude. I mean, the key message, I think metasurfaces really are a promising technology all the way from RF to visible. They do have a strong potential to replace bulk components. Of course, not in every application. Um, the biggest constraint I think at the moment is bandwidth. Careful engineering can allow you to overcome that to some extent, but it also reveals precisely what the limitations are. For microwaves and millimeter waves, and possibly also for terahertz, these PCB designs with three metallic layers are the most promising. In most cases, Huygens metasurfaces are good enough. I spoke briefly about bionisotropic structures. Um, my personal conclusion is that mostly they're not warranted, um, perhaps in certain cases. Near field effects can be a real nuisance and can hamper a design process, but we've shown how that can be resolved without needing 
blind uh, sim uh, optimization with full wave simulation. Broadband designs can be achieved, can be incorporated into rational existing rational design methods and can give us those uh, performance limits. And finally, I touch briefly on the potential of highly sub-wavelength meta-atoms uh, to unlock further functionality. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions if there's time. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Uh, yes, there is still time for uh, a number of questions. Uh, if we have any, I hope uh, people missed my uh, introduction and saved their questions till the end. So uh, if anyone has any, uh, yeah, a, a question from Alexei. Hello, David. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, so no I worries. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a question related to the like uh, meta surfaces for millimeter waves in terms of application. I wonder what is the level of dissipative losses in these meta surfaces for 80 gigahertz, let's say in percentages. Do you know? I mean, so these measurements here, these are calibrated against a metallic plate. You know, um, so perhaps this is not the best one. Uh, if I come back to one of the earlier, where are we? You know, so we're talking a couple of dB of loss mm -hmm. um, is what we were, and this is not with a fully optimized structure. So of course you've got to be using the right materials. Right, this is not uh, FR4. <laughs> um, I forget the exact stack up. It's not Rogers uh, Solar, one of the other uh, specialty uh, microwave, millimeter wave materials. And this was really, you know, this was the best quality PCB fabrication that we could find commercially available. Um, mm -hmm. So it is pushing so the envelope a bit. Yeah, but, but probably uh, I just wonder, do, let's say, people really need, uh, let's say, dielectric metal surfaces produced by, let's say, very, very high quality ceramic material or whatever for this frequency range or no? I think it depends what you're doing. I mean, something like that, it sounds like you would be going for these, you know, these kind of security or defense kind of applications. I think... I mean, what we've deliberately tried to avoid is complex bulk 3D fabrication. All right. If you're able to do that, probably that unlocks further potential, overcomes some of the limitations. But I think the cost would limit you to certain application areas. That's my feeling. Thank you very much. Uh Okay, uh, thank you, David. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I had a couple of questions myself about uh, the analytical uh, um, analytical equations for some of the meta atom uh, design and uh, on the near field coupling. Because in both cases, first when you mentioned uh, uh, the coupling uh, between uh, the near field coupling, uh, you mentioned that uh, you could just uh, simulate it and get uh, the uh, non-diagonal parameters of uh, that matrix. And uh, another, in another case, you when you were uh, talking about the broadband uh, drop bond atom, uh, about its geometry, you mentioned that uh, some of the design elements are coupled, to, uh, are linked to inductance and capacitance. Uh, so, uh, can you uh, elaborate if there are any? analytical uh, uh, equations here that you can use uh, to estimate those uh, non-diagonal elements and the, the link uh, of geometry to inductance and capacitance, or is it uh, you can only get them through simulations? Yeah, so I guess these, I mean, these are the original methods. Uh, 
perhaps a bit better off showing you these ones. I would say to get accurate results, you need full wave simulation, but you can know where to start based on some intuition. Of, um, so here, here we're talking about the broadband structure. Um, look, we don't, of course, this L and C, they're not fitted at DC, right? So we can't use any simple quasi-static analysis uh, to tell us exactly what the L and C will be of these geometries, all right? They are, it's full electrodynamics, they are on resonance. But still, your intuition can help you because if, for example, you close this gap between these two metallic uh, sort of, uh, sorry, I'm not pointing, am I? Between these two gaps of the capacitive plate, of course, this C will increase, All right? Similarly, if you make this width of the metallic layer narrower, you do see that the inductance changes as well, it starts to increase. So you definitely can use your intuition here uh, in, this, in this broadband design. When it comes to the near field terms, um, sorry, where are we? Uh, I guess we haven't tried too hard. This, is a, this has been a pet topic of mine for many years. Um, you can, so whether these terms here could be fitted to some mutual inductance and capacitance. We have not attempted that so far. I think it would be possible. Um, for the moment, this has been good enough. Where I think it would make sense would be if we wanted to have coarse geometry, but still try to get achromatic performance and try to be essentially combining this technique with our broadband design. That's when we'd really want to know, well, what is this mutual term? Can we fit it to some analytical function? Okay, uh, thank you. That sort of uh, answers my question. Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Uh, uh, oh, no, we have another question from Alexia, right? Yeah, David, I, I'm curious about your last part of your talk in terms of subwavelength meta atoms. So how subwavelength they can be at the end of the day? Uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I mean, you see this, uh, well, how many elements we have in our supercell. Um, sorry, I'm missing the numbers here. Uh, in the earlier works, we were having four or five, you know, four or five elements here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a limit to how far you can push because this second mode, we want to use this second mode. And we know from the true limit that if we make the structure too small, that we get high Q, high radiative Q. Of course, this metal layer is always lossy and gives us some dissipative Q. If we have high radiative Q, and high dissipative Q, that leads to this, what's sometimes called over damp. So you lose the phase response. So, I mean, we've done a, we've made this about as sub wavelength as possible. Um, and I think it's hard to push it much further than that. It really, it's actually the material losses in some sense becomes a critical parameter. I see, I see, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Alexi and uh, David. So uh, with this, I think we would uh, conclude our seminar. I would uh, th thank again the speaker and uh, thank uh, everyone uh, who took their time and came here early morning or the early uh, after work afternoon on the other side of the globe. Uh, and uh, yes, so we would see you probably next week. And next week we will have a talk uh, by Lubov Lubina on full uh, 
a metal slot with reflectory antennas. So if you uh, have some time, join us next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again for hosting this talk. It's uh, much appreciated. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, David.